Here's the statement for the Poincaré conjecture. Today I'm not going to go into the history of the conjecture, why it's so important, and how it was proved, and some of the quirky behaviour of the guy who proved it. Nor am I going to go into the proof. What I want to do today is really pick apart the statement so that we can understand it better. Hopefully this will be a, a base for you if you want to go on and learn more about this conjecture or topology. So the statement in this form doesn't help us that much. Let's put it in this form. Exactly the same, but I've just split it into three distinct uh, lines. So firstly, we have this these things called simply connected closed three manifolds. So we need to understand that. Down the bottom, we can see the three sphere, another sort of object. So we better understand that. And in the middle, we say is homeomorphic too. And what does that mean? Well, at one level, it just means that the two objects are similar. Uh, to take it another step further, it means that we can go from one object to the other object simply by stretching and compressing, but without tearing or puncturing the object. But what we want to do today is go a little, make it a bit more thorough, a bit more mathematical in terms of what it means for something to be homeomorphic. So let's start with the meaning of a three sphere. To do that, let's go back to the one sphere. So this is a one sphere. It's what we call in everyday life a circle. So it, a one sphere is one dimensional. The line is just one dimensional. It sits in two dimensional space and every point is an equal distance from the center of the one sphere. Now let's go to the two sphere, which in everyday life we just called a sphere. So the two sphere is a is a two dimensional surface. It sits in three dimensional space and every point is an equal distance from the center of the two sphere. And so that then naturally takes us to the three sphere. The three sphere has a three dimensional surface. It sits in four dimensional space and every point is the same distance from the center of the four sphere. Unfortunately, my poor little three dimensional brain can't work out how to display the three sphere. So that's all I want to say about the three sphere. Now let's turn to what it means for two objects to be homeomorphic. So here's an object, which is a line interval from negative one to one, including the endpoints negative one and one. And our second object down the bottom is the line interval from negative 2 to 2, including the two endpoints, negative 2 and 2. So the first requirement to prove that these two objects are homeomorphic is that we must have a function that maps all of the first object onto all of the second object. And in our case, there is such a function, the function fx equals 2 times x. The inverse of f must map all of the second object onto all of the first object. That's the second requirement. So in this case, the inverse is the function gx equals x on 2. And in fact, it does map all of the second object onto all of the first object. The third requirement is that both of these functions must be continuous. Now, continuity is a phenomenally huge topic and the this YouTube video would go for hours if I explained all of that properly. So I'm just going to use the layman's explanation, which is that a function is continuous if you can draw it without lifting your pen. So in the case of f and g, those two functions, you can draw uh, 2x and x on 2 as a graph without lifting your pen. On the other hand, here's a function where you can see that there's this big jump at x equals 3, and so this function is not continuous. But if we go back now to the two intervals, uh, we can see that it satisfies the three requirements for um, us to conclude that object 1 is homeomorphic to object 2. Now let's look at another example. Here we've got the line interval from negative 1 to 1, but on this occasion we're going to exclude the endpoints, negative 1 and 1. So this is the line interval, negative one is less than x is less than one. And our second interval is gonna be the entire real number line. So negative infinity is less than x is less than infinity. 
Now, at first you might say, these aren't homeomorphic. But if we go through the um, process, firstly, we can find a function, this time fx involving the tan function. In, in fact, it does map all of the first object onto all of the second object. The inverse of f is g, which involves the inverse tan function, and that does in fact map all of the second object onto all of the first object. And it turns out that f and g are both continuous. So we conclude that negative 1 is less than x is less than 1 is homeomorphic to the entire real number line. Here's a final example going up a dimension or two. This is an ellipsoid, <coughs> pardon me, which is like a rugby ball which sits in three-dimensional space and it turns out that this is homeomorphic to the uh, sphere sitting in three-dimensional space. So I hope that's given you an understanding of what it means for two objects to be homeomorphic. Okay, now it's time to talk about what a manifold is. But before I do that, i just point out I've got about um, 40, 50 YouTube videos now. So if you like this video, you might find some of my others interesting. There's the Made Easy series where I go through late high school and university level maths problems. There's a playlist, How Things Work, where I go things through things like uh, Google search, GPS, internet encryption. And then there's another playlist where I've got things like intro and Riemann hypothesis, intro proof of Fermat's last theorem, the number E, formulas for pi, the largest number, those sort of things. So have a look at them if you're interested. So now manifolds. What is a manifold? Well, informally, a manifold is a surface that locally resembles... Uh, a tangent plane near every point. So let's have a look at an example. Here's um, a surface, z equals x squared plus y squared. And you can see here the, the surface. Now as we expand the picture just around the, uh, the origin, you can see what starts to happen. The surface starts to flatten out as we get closer and closer as we move across the across to the right. And you can see that once we get to the third one, um, that the curve or the surface uh, does start to resemble the tangent plane at that point. And in fact, if you think about it, for every point on this surface, um, if we look at one point and just expand it out and just look closer and closer at it, uh, locally it's going to start to look like just a flat surface which is the tangent plane at that point. So that's what a manifold is. So the sphere's a manifold, the torus is a manifold, and this curve or surface z equals y squared plus uh, z equals y squared plus x squared is also a manifold. Okay, so now we have to think about what it is to be a closed manifold. And if you look that up on Wikipedia, it'll tell you that, that it's a compact manifold with no boundaries. And if you look up compact manifold, it'll start to talk about a manifold that is closed and bounded. So we're looking for a closed bounded manifold with no boundary. Now, bounded is quite easy. It means, in a, way, in a sense, uh, finite in some respects. And really what it means is that this surface whatever it is, this manifold, can be sort of put in a huge box in the appropriate dimension. So um, the sphere is bounded, whilst um, that surface we had before, z equals y squared plus x squared, is not bounded. So we want bounded manifolds. Now, we said we need a, a surface that is closed but has no boundaries. And the definition of closed in this sense is something that includes all its boundaries. So we want something that includes all its boundaries but has no boundaries. So let's talk a little bit further about that. Okay, here's the surface x squared plus y squared is less than 1. You can see the dotted line round the circle, round the surface. That's because we don't include that uh, dotted line as part of the surface. So if we take this red dot here which we put right on the on the edge of the surface. This red dot is part of the boundary because if we draw a little circle 
around this dot, and in fact it doesn't matter what size the circle is. It includes some of the surface and some of what is not the surface. In contrast, these two points here are not part of the boundary because you can draw a little circle around and you'll either get all of the surface or you'll get none of the surface. So the boundary is in fact the dotted line and in the, this case this surface does not include its boundaries and so it is not a closed surface. On the other hand over on the right now we have x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1 and now the boundary is included in the surface and so this is a closed surface. We've introduced a lot of concepts here so let's just go back to the conjecture and try and look at the big picture. So we started out with the three sphere which is a three-dimensional surface in a higher dimensional space where every point is an equal distance from the center of the three sphere. We talked about two objects being homeomorphic. So object one is homeomorphic to object two. If we can create a function from all of object one to all of object two, the inverse of the function goes from all of object two to all of object one, and both of the functions are continuous. We talked about a manifold, a surface, where if you look at every point and blow it up, magnify it, it just becomes essentially a flat surface. And so the three manifold is a three dimensional surface that has this manifold property. We talked about a closed manifold, which means two things. Firstly, it's a finite size, which means there's always a box that's big enough to put the surface in. And secondly, we said that it can't have any boundaries. So now it's just left to discuss what it means for things to be simply connected. So let's uh, reintroduce the torus and the sphere. Remember, we're only talking here about the surfaces, not what's in the middle. So this torus, this donut over here, is a, is a donut that Homer Simpson would never want because there's nothing in it. It's just the surface. Okay, so the first thing is that um, the surface must be path connected to be simply connected. So path connected just means that if we nominate any two points on the surface, there is always a path between them where we stay on the surface the entire time. So both of these satisfy that. Now the second thing is that to be simply connected means that if we have two nominated, any two nominated points, there must be a path between them. In fact, there'll be many paths between them. And if it's simply connected, it just means that you can transform from any path to any other path by just shifting along the surface, uh, compressing or expanding the path. So in the case of the sphere, it is simply connected because any, any two paths from these two points can be transformed from one to the other. However, with the torus, that's not the case because here are the two points and one path, for example, goes in front so we can see it. The second path goes around the back and comes back to the second point. Now these two paths are not capable of being transformed into each other without uh, lifting from the surface. So the torus is not simply connected. So that finishes now all the concepts that are involved here in um, the Poincaré conjecture. There's a lot here, so I don't envisage that you'll immediately understand all aspects of it having watched this video, but I hope it's given you a sort of a, a broader sense of what's involved and enable you to then dig deeper to understand further some of the things um, that are involved in this conjecture.